Welcome back, everybody, to Science Fiction and Fantasy Read Along, a podcast and book club dedicated to a somewhat deeper reading of our favorite books and series. I am Lul Stamp, and I'm happy to be joined today. Guys, would you please introduce yourselves, and you will unmute your, unmute your mic, yeah? Hey, this is DM Phil, um, standing by, ready to talk about, about this book, which is awesome. Too many words. Okay, Yule, your turn. Hey, everybody. My name is Yule. I can't wait to finish this last chapter of The Black Company. I just made DM Phil really mad. It was great. All right. In our last episode, we read the first part of Chapter 6, The Ladies' Chapter. In it, the rebel lays siege to the Tower at Charm. If you are new to the podcast or if you haven't consumed the previous episodes, we recommend that you start at the beginning. All episodes are available on YouTube and everywhere podcasts grow. In this episode, we're discussing the end of chapter six, like the last 10 pages or so, and chapter seven, which is quite short, called Rose. That is the finale. This is the end. Are you guys ready to dig in? Yeah. Okay. We left off last episode with the beheading of Soulcatcher by Croker and the lady kind of giggling about the whole thing. And now they're on their way back on the carpet. I think the lady's pretty wounded. She broke her leg. I know that much. And they're on their way back to the tower. And for whatever reason, they're having a real hard time keeping that carpet in the air. It must have been wrecked or something. I, I'm not real clear on, on exactly what happened. You guys remember? Yeah, yeah. it was wrecked. Well, yeah, they, they hit the horse plus soul catcher at the same time and kind of totaled it. Do you remember that? I do. I don't, I don't remember it being totaled, but obviously it was because that's the effect. <clears throat> Another important thing to remember is that when they left, it was like the climax of the battle and the defense of charm. And the enemy, the rebel, had already gotten to the third tier. And they were, um, and all of a sudden, like, the lady just said, hey, let's go get Soulcatcher now, right now. And so she left her fortress, she left the battle, and she took Croker with her, and they hauled off. And that's, that's, that's where we left. The, the city was about to get, the fortress was about to get overrun. That's, that, that's all we knew. And now they're going back. Yeah. Now they're on their way back. Yule? I agree. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so they're on the carpet, and they're cruising back. And I think Croker's having second thoughts about his loyalties to this this woman he's described her as near enough to the embodiment of evil that it, it doesn't matter one way or another she's she's not a great she's not a good person and he doesn't really care for her anymore and uh like i said she's struggling to keep this thing afloat and croker is for whatever reason peering over the side i think he said he was looking for a looking for a good place to crash it if necessary and when he's peeking over the side he sees down below a little girl. A little girl is a darling, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. And the minute he sees her, a hand streaks out of the shadows and like kind of pulls her to cover so she can't be seen anymore. And this is right before they get back to Charm, within a mile certainly, because they're in the, um, the wasteland of black rock and rubble. That's where that was. Anyway, so by all appearances, Darling and Raven are, are on their way out. And Croker thinks maybe that the black company was routed. And this is, you know, this is the effect is Darling and Raven are outside, like running for their lives, but they make it back to the tower. He says there are dead in formation wind rows of the dead that just dropped immediately, like from, the, from a living person to a dead person without leaving formation. And he, he estimated their numbers at a quarter of a million dead on the field of battle. But there's nobody defending the tower. If there were any people defending the tower, they're now inside. And they're, they cruise on up to the tower, about 300 feet shy of the top where they're trying to go in. There's some rebel archers down below taking pot shots, but they can't, they can't make it. So the lady's struggling to get it up to the top. And then we see a familiar face from an earlier chapter. You remember who it was? Oh, yeah. The limper. Oh, he's the back. The limper comes back. The limper's back. So, so the limper, if y'all recall, uh, he was shot through with an arrow with his true name on it. He was shot several more times. He was kicked in the face. He was beaten up. He was tied up. He was, he was penetrated with snakes of fire. He was tortured. He was brutalized. And then the lady said she was going to torture him for centuries or something, you know. And, nope. 
Not doing any of that. Well, let's be honest. She didn't say torture. She said he would provide entertainment for centuries. That's uh, fair enough. Maybe. Who knows what that meant? Fair enough. Court jester. Who knows? <laughs> fair enough. Anyway, he's back. He's on top of the tower. And he's like, yeah, here's a rope. And he throws a rope down. And I think he brings some men that throw a rope down. He's too good for throwing ropes. So some ropes go down. And, and they're like, some, some, some underlings are up there. And they're like, Tie, harness her up. And he's like, what about me? So they... They get uh they give him a rope too and and they they get back up on top of the tower and Croker takes a little nap. To me, it was a little bit strange that 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 he finally his nerves are just like on edge. They're raw and he's gone through all this and yeah, on some level he's he's bound to be like tired, but not like physically tired because he hasn't done that much. Maybe emotionally tired, maybe just in shock. I don't know, but like he literally gets to the top and lays down and goes to sleep, which I thought was kind of a very strange change. I mean. Uh, who knows? Maybe that was just some sort of like uh, author segue to get him out of the picture for a minute. Well, the thing about Croker is that he's been kind of running in a daze for the last couple of days with that bow. Yeah. With that bow in his hand, con- you know, constantly knocking it without realizing it, losing time. And then he goes and he beheads his, uh, uh, I don't know, leader. So patron. She's a patron, patron, I would guess. I'll catch her. He feels really horrible about it. And the person that he's kind of uh, grown an attachment to, at least in fantasies, the lady has proven to be a real pill. <laughs> so uh, he's exhausted mentally. He's exhausted. Phys- Don't forget, when they were riding that carpet, they slammed right into the horse and everything like that. There's a. Uh, <laughs> He's been through a couple of uh, bumps and bruises also. So just zonking out at the very end. And don't forget, as they were climbing to get to the top of the tower, the lady loses it just for a moment and they sink. Yeah. He's like, I almost lose my lunch. So Croker's been through a lot. Give him a break. Uh, He's definitely had a lot of stress in his life for the last couple of days. And if... Really years. If you've been, yeah, probably years, but especially strong recently. And stress has that effect on me where once the stress is relieved, I just, oh, it just, you know, feels so nice to have the stress disappear. Anyway, so he's stress free at the moment. He doesn't know where the black company is, he doesn't know anything. He just knows that he and the lady got off the cart or the carpet, I suppose it is, and he took his little nap. Well, well, he was told that they were still fighting inside the fortress. Who told him that? Nobody told him that. No, yeah, some of the other soldiers did. Didn't he infer that? No, the soldiers told him that. That there was fighting going on inside? Yes. Hmm. I don't remember him having any conversations when he's on top of the tower. But anyway, it doesn't matter. They would have retreated. There was heavy fighting downstairs, they said. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah. Got it. Anyway. So... Does that end the chapter? Does that end chapter six? Like, where does chapter six actually end? Like, what's the last stuff that happens? Well, um, he sleeps, but by the time he wakes up, that all of the fighting is done. He finds out that uh, there had been some Easterners that had been hidden away in the citadel or in the fortress for some time. And also, they've been shuffling in the wounded. And the lady herself was healing a lot of these wounded mm-hmm. to give her, to bolster her, her numbers and her strength, which proves... Maybe she does have a heart. Uh, her self-interest might have, might have been responsible for that. Nevertheless, the Eastern troops belonged to whom? They were the Howlers? Yes. Okay, the Howlers troops from the East. Yeah, what's up, Yule? Uh, there was, uh, just before the chapter ended and he was asleep, he, uh, Croker, that is, had a vision, a dream. Well, go on and explain. All right, so the dream was where he saw him on a landscape of tomorrow where he saw the lady's triumph turning like a serpent and generating her destruction during the next passage of the comet. And he saw the white rose with him. And that was the dream. With Croker, you mean? Yeah, with Croker. Um, I saw a true white rose carrying her standard to the tower uh, saw she and her champions as clearly as if I were there that day myself. I think he's inferring that he's one of the champions. <laughs> Regardless, he, he had a vision. And in his vision, the white rose is triumphant at the Tower of Charm. 
Okay. Well, there's a, one more component when he talks about futurism and instincts and, and whatever. Um, just before that, yes. when he was leaving, he grabbed four horses. He's like, I have no idea why I grabbed four. Yeah, they were. Uh, f- he took Feather's horse mm-hmm. and then three other ones that were just the same style. Well, it's, it's if he had a sense that he needed them, even though before he even knew that he needed them. And that takes place. That's foreshadowing. But he did. He took four, and he didn't didn't remember or recognize why, but he, he just felt that he needed them. So stop stop me if I'm wrong, but that was that was when he's trying to find the black company. That's right. He, yeah, I think that's like right after the dream. During his nap, they had moved on and they started forming a picket line, and he's trying to figure out where they are. So he grabs some horses and he heads off to go find his his fellows. Right. Yeah. And that's when he comes across One Eye and the Four Velaka. Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 One eye's torturing the four Olaka. Yeah. That was a really brief paragraph or two, but it was really, really well done. Uh, basically he comes across one eye speaking the four Velaka, as we recall, was crucified over by Stormbringers camp. And there's one eye speaking in a language that Croker does not understand very softly talking to the four Velaka. And he said he was stretching it out and he was disgusted when I didn't notice him come or go. But when he left, he was disgusted. I guess we never were able to determine factually if it was shapeshifter or the four Velaka that killed Tom Tom in chapter one or two or whatever it was. But I think he's torturing the four Velaka because he can't torture shapeshifter. Uh, do you think that's a fair assessment? Well, uh, yes and no. I, I think it was definitely implied that Shifter was the four Velaka that that went into the paper tower and and slaughtered everybody and and also killed his brother. But I also do you also remember it was a four Velaka that killed One Eye's master back in the day? Yeah, but I, I think that's not his motivation now. I think it's and they even imply it. I think in last chapter where One Eye finally understands who killed his brother. And also he's frustrated because he know he can't, he can't, he can't punish. Yeah, that's him. right. He did say that. I remember we discussed this in the last episode and he did say something that is near as enough. He, he couldn't tell, he didn't know which one it was, but he knew it was one or the other and he was going to outlast them both. Nevertheless, um, that is the end of the, that is the end of chapter six. Am I right? Yeah, he finds the black company and and uh, and that's that. And he steals himself for the confrontation that is yet to come with the captain. Okay, so tell me about that. What what's going on there? Uh, well, for a couple chapters now, Croker's been saying we got to ditch this scene big time. Yeah, and he even more thinks that now than he did then. Why? Uh, well, he doesn't like the lady. He doesn't like her at all. She's been in him. Uh, mentally probably spiritually (laughs) Mm. and uh he already was a sort of good guy although there have been things about croaker that aren't so cool to you know just any reader reading (laughs) sure but by you know on a scale of you know one to ten and in comparison to the people around him passion for people that is something that a lot of people even in his own company don't have Okay, so I want to talk about that in a little bit more detail yeah, no and when we summarize the entire book. So just yeah. bear that in mind, please. Yes, ahead, sir. All right, Phil. Oh, uh, one last comment that uh, is actually a, a new topic that we hadn't encountered before. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but the, the, entire, the entire book has been like devoid of any sort of like religious musings or, or talk about gods or clerics or priests. Mm-hmm. There really hasn't been anything in there. But at the very end of chapter six, Croker goes there for the first time, and he says, he says, I am not religious. I cannot conceive of gods who would give a damn about humanity's frothy carings on. I mean, logically, beings of that order just wouldn't. And I wonder, this is the first time they've ever talked about gods, and so I don't know if in general people don't believe in, in gods or deities here in this world, or, or that's, that's the author kind of like sticking in his his own two bits on his, his beliefs or if that's just a soldier's thought process after you see so much death and suffering. Well, when the, when the, when the people that you're dealing with in life 
are as powerful as demigods in their own right, and their, their boss, Soulcatcher, was described as powerful as a demigod, then, like, where's the distinction, you know? Like, when those people are walking around on the face of the earth, like, what is a deity? I mean, do you worship the lady? Some people probably do. But is there, is there a higher... Uh, yeah, I agree. That's, it's kind of interesting. Interesting, excuse me, that uh, he would bring that up at this point. I yeah, I'm, I'm having I, doubts, right? I, I actually marked that whole paragraph there because it's just a real interesting paragraph. There seems that Croker, although he says at the very beginning he's not religious, he does feel that there is some sort of force for good. Um, you know, and he kind of like talks about. I don't know, like this collective consciousness uh, that can take over. And it's very interesting because in the next chapter, I think it pays a little bit of uh, uh, this, this, ch this part of the paragraph is, you know, something that he's going to have you know, going forward. I got a question for you, Yule. Yeah, what's that? Are you referring to the future? No, I'm not. I'm referring to this paragraph. <laughs> so have we, <laughs> have we talked about why – Croker is getting these visions. I don't remember. Did we did we breach that topic before? No. We're we, saving we that for the end. It. Yeah, we skipped it for the end. Okay. All right. Never mind. All right. So chapter seven is titled Rose. You can infer that that is the white rose that we're talking about here. And it's very, very long. Probably, right? Anyway. Well, we will. Croker does engage the captain in a an argument. It takes two or three hours, and by the end of it, most of everybody that we know in the Black Company, as well as a couple of the new recruits who were troops from the ladies' army that are now part of the Black Company, they're now captains in the Black Company, they've trooped through, and they've all been listening to Croker's argument. And it doesn't really specify what his arguments are, but Silent and a couple of the ladies' captains are backing Croker. They want to get out, but the captain's not having any of it. And essentially the captain is a kind of a dictator in that sense. He, he does not get the votes necessary to convince them to bail on. And even then he's still not giving it up. So he's not able to convince them one way or another. Well, he's not able to convince the captain. He doesn't get the votes necessary. They decide not to bail on their commission. I guess they're still a little bit embarrassed from the previous bailing nevertheless well it's not only that it's also the fact that they have the getting's good now the rebels defeated and all there is is spoils of war yeah the, the entire continent the manhood of an entire continent has been laid waste as was described at the end of the last chapter now would be the time to bail the lady wouldn't really be able to probably marshal the forces to bring them back however she would remember and it's not like she's going to die of old age anytime soon right with the argument done, Croker's kind of upset and he goes storming around and eventually they send Goblin to kind of feel him out to figure out what's going on and like why he's so completely upset. And ultimately, it's kind of brought up that Raven's gone. He must have died in combat and Darling along with him. That's what is said by the players of Tonk. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, exploits that are being uh, discussed about how awesome Raven was and how he pretty much saved everybody in the company's life at least once. Yeah, and there's a there's a pretty interesting description of a of a moment when Darling does the same thing, right? Yeah, she uh, everybody's affected by magic except for her. Yeah, and she ends up waking everybody up and <laughs> saves yeah. their life. And yeah, so then Raven got knocked out along with everybody that was around him, and then she just kind of looked confused for a second and then went and tapped Raven. He woke up and started killing people again. But they're gone. They're, they've, they've died in combat, and the captain sent people out to go look for the dead and to, like, bury their own and et cetera, and they'd probably find them later on that night. But uh, obviously, Croker's already seen that Darling's not around, so he knows better. And he decides that he wants to go and find them. So he gets a horse. With silence. What's, what's, the, what's the order of operations here? He, uh, well, uh, well, silence with him. Yeah, right? he's communicating with silent in uh, Darling speak. Yes, yeah, sign sign language. Yes. Exactly. Well, um, silent can't talk. So they're going and they're getting provisions and those horses. 
and uh, they're going to go try and meet Raven. Like that's their, like they, they, they get the idea that he is in his home territory. Yeah. And so he knows exactly where he's going. So they think they know where he's going and they get like, you know, information from pickles that he got some food earlier. And, you know, it, it seems like a lot of people know what's going on. Really. Yeah. But nobody's saying anything because nobody wants to kind of corroborate the fact that he's deserting. Yeah. With darling. Exactly. Okay, so Elmo divvies out Croker's portion of the money that they got when they took out Harden. No, not Harden. What was his name? Raker? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, when they took out Raker, they kept all that money, and everybody that was there got a chunk of it. Croker gets his portion of that money, a couple of extra horses, takes Silent, and they go looking for Raven. And they track them down based on where they were last seen, uh, finding signs, and knowing what Yule just said, knowing where they were going to be going. They, they go farther. They, like, go in a route. I don't know. Maybe Philip can explain it more than I can on this one. Um, they just kind of, like, they head them off at the pass and then wait for them. They knew where they were seen. Then they tracked the outside of the – of the, the no man's land and found their trail, which led them to the main road. And then they didn't know whether it was going north or south because so many footfalls had gone. But science said, no, I can tell. They went south. So they went south. And they went as hard as they could. And they rode all night and into the next day. To get ahead. To get ahead. Which they did. And then they just kind of stake out the road. And then eventually they see – a tall person and a short person walking up the road. Silent goes down and ahead of them. Croker kind of slips around behind. When Raven and Darling see Silent on the road, they stop. Raven's real cagey and nervous, and then Croker's behind them. And they get really nervous, but they have this conversation, and it goes a little bit like this. Hey, what are you doing, buddy? Hey, what are you doing, buddy? Hey, uh, we noticed that you were gone and you didn't say goodbye. And we, you know, we thought we were buds and here you are, you know, leaving without saying goodbye. The concern is expressed. I think at this point it's fair to say that we know who the white rose is. Would you not agree? Well, yeah, I, I can't remember exactly where he says it, but he kind of like says like, or Croker, sorry. He starts thinking that he's known who the white rose is for quite some time now. Well, he had that vision, and he yeah. saw her, and he recognized her. Oh, that's – yeah, well, yeah, I and mean, then – exactly. <laughs> and he knew that he'd known the White Rose all along, and it's Darling. And Raven figured it out. At some point in time, Raven figured it out, and in order to keep her safe, which he views – he must view as a moral imperative, he's bailing on the Black Company with, with Darling to ensure her survival because she's – literally next door to the person who's going to want her killed. So Croker hands over two horses and all of the money that he got out of that fiasco with Raker. And he warns him not to go where he's thinking of going or is not a safe place. I forget the other town barrel. I, I don't think it was barrel. Oh, yeah. Was there an opal? It, well, yeah, I think you're right. I think it was opal. And he's like, don't go to opal. The limpers back. The limper knows your M.O. The limper is going to put two and two together and he's going to track you down and there, thereby find the white rose. So you need to change your plans. And I think Raven's kind of – Raven, you know, he's a hard case, but I think Croker's – Croker and Silence showing up scared him, first of all, but then once, you know, he's giving him money, giving him horses, telling him not to, not to do these – It things. took Raven a while because he kind of like was pulling his steel out. Yo, his blade was bare. And, yeah. and he, it took him a while to put it back, even after like all their conversation. All Croker, he, Croker kept going on. Hey, you hurt us. You yeah. know, you're supposed to be our brother. We took you in. Well, we did all this stuff with you. Well, keep in mind, like Silent and Croker, like conscientiously, like stayed out of knife throwing range. Oh yeah, <laughs> out of out of the reach of steel. I think is what he said. Yeah, and I, on opposite ends too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, uh, Raven. Yeah, it's just like he's – so eventually, you know, he puts that puts that blade away. He does. And Croker gives Darling her birthday present, which is never described. 
but she she's overjoyed by the present and the entire time she's just friendly as she always is like the past is behind behind her is the way croker describes it but yeah. the future for her is so uncertain and so full of stress and danger but he gives her the gift and she loves it and he cries and has to hide his face so that, you know, she doesn't see and like so he, even yeah. pretends it never happened. And the other guys are like kicking, kicking rocks at the yeah. same time. You know, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> There's the, um, that one moment where I don't know if you're getting to it or if you're passing it where Raven actually offers, Hey, why don't you come with us? Yeah, he does. Yeah. And he says, I'm too old. I'm he's part of the black old. company. I'm part of the company. The captain's part of the company. We're in this thing together. We're family. That's how he ends it. We're family. Yeah. And he reminds him of the reading and how he felt, how Raven felt during the reading in chapter four with the an old analyst of the black company. When Raven had said, you made me feel something for the first time in a long time. He's like, you remember that feeling? Well, that's maybe you didn't understand it, but that's the black company. Like they are family. So they give him the horses. They give him the money. They give him some advice. And I think they part ways. They don't look, they don't look back. Does that end the novel? Well, the very last line of the novel is when Croker's thinking, he's like, wow, 37 years before the comet returns. The vision has to be false. I'll never saw, survive that long. Will I? And that was the end. Finito. The end. So that, that short chapter, which is why we did it this way. So... First question I have for the both of you is just the simple, easy. Did you like the book? How, how did you feel about it? I mean, because we've all read this book more, multiple times now. So how did you feel about it doing this kind of a, a deeper reading and discussion? Well, I've never like dissected a book to this level before my entire life. And I found it incredibly gratifying. I mean, I liked the story before, but when I read it and we talked about it and we picked it apart, I feel enriched. You know, I saw so many things I never picked up the first time. And, and you, even things you can just read between the lines, not just the over telling you things that you missed. Uh, yes, I found it very, very gratifying. More gratifying than just reading it the first time. I agree. I agree. Yule? I enjoyed the book quite a, quite a bit. I thought it was really deep. It had a lot of uh, machinations going on in it. More than you really think, you know, if you're just reading. It feels like a diary. You know, Croker's writing your this diary. Yeah. And also, you know, going over this with someone else or, you know, when you listen to other podcasts about books, um, there's always something you miss. Of or maybe course. you don't understand something quite the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. Um, not that we're necessarily right about anything, but, you know, it's just, you know, another way to look at something. And that's good. Um, uh, at the end of this chapter, when he's talking about, he also gave um, <laughs> a croaker, I'm sorry, using pronouns too much. Croker gives Raven the information on where those papers are that he found when Soul Catcher and, right. was being, you know, beheaded by him. Yeah, I forgot about that. And he refers to Soul Catcher as he. Yeah, he did. He still <laughs> continues to con you know talk about Soul Catcher as he. Old habits, right? It's just funny that way. And you know, that's a neat little arty kind of thing that you know not everybody would necessarily you know do. Did he mention he he easily didn't, the color sheet? He did not tell anybody. Well, he didn't tell Raven, certainly, that Soulcatcher was a woman. Yeah. He never had that opportunity. Even with all this stuff that he's giving Raven, he's still pulling back just a little bit. Well, um, I, he probably really is genuinely hurt that Raven would bail on them like that. He did it in a very not classy way. You know, he just upped and left and took Darling and left them guessing. You know, they had to chase him down to get any answers. And they, they kind of knew, everybody kind of knew, but... Well, that, that was actually a really important part of that, that Croker and Silent kind of figured out that everybody must have suspected, they just chose to say nothing. Everybody's holding something back. Even the captain. Even yep. the captain. And Pickles. Pickles. The captain. Elmo. I mean, he listed off a ton of people that Dude. they had talked to, and everybody was kind of like, yeah, we don't, we don't know. 
If this was Pickle's story, he would know even more than Croker, probably. <laughs> Maybe. He's worked in the commissary, right? <laughs> Oh, talk about people, people giving, like, dirty deals to get what they want. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Pickles yeah. has dirt on everybody. All right, so why don't we – okay, so we've discussed the book chapter by chapter at this point. Well, uh, Lul, how do you like the book? I love this book. I think that if you look at the old cover, the original cover with that painting on it, which I don't really like, if you judge the book by its cover, it just looks like a trashy fantasy novel. Maybe it's got some horror elements to it. But this book, it shocked me the first time I read it. And its depth and precision and quality shocked me again the second and third times I read it. Uh, I, can't, I cannot recommend it more highly than I do. For what it is, it, it is a masterpiece, in, in my opinion. And it's a little over 300 pages, which is wonderful. Yeah, and there's three more books just in the original trilogy, plus like nine more afterwards. I mean, it's like it, it does not end. You can just keep going and going and going. So I love this book. That's why we're doing this podcast. I, I'm, I mean, we're all in agreement here, right? Yeah, bravo. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I wrote it, yes. Um, okay, so now let's talk about a couple of interesting things that we noticed throughout the entirety of the book that really weren't fair to talk about in the individual chapters. These are like overarching things. And there's one in particular that Philip brought up last time that we weren't able to talk about because the, we needed the book to end before we talked about it. And that I'm going to leave to Philip to say. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I remember. So um, I think we brought up the fact, this theory that we had based on a growing body of evidence that Croker is taken. Mm -hmm. Right. And Raven knows that he is. That's why he's so paranoid. He certainly knows that he's he spends a lot of time with the lady. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest it. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to one I'm I'm trying to go piecemeal impromptu. Yeah, what was the first thing that what was the first thing that you saw that you were like, hey, wait a minute, that's not right. Oh, um, I think it was something you said to me that made it click, or maybe you figured it out first. I don't remember, but how the dominator has a greater influence on women, suggesting that he uses sexual influence on, on, in some matter, maybe touching somebody on an instinctual level uh, to, to dominate them. And go back, way back in history, when Croker first starts thinking about the lady, he's always, already having romantic thoughts about him. So the dominator is influencing these women across hundreds and hundreds of miles. Why cannot the lady already be influencing Croker to be to, to, to be her man, right? Without him even realizing it. And the Dominator is in the grave still. Yes. Just uh, well, it doesn't mean uh, that he's taken. It does or, not. No, You're right. This, You're right. That's one. Piece but maybe of it's a slow drip situation. It's the it's the kind of thing that mm -hmm. just it started the chain reaction that got us thinking along these lines. Though that was that was the first indication that we had that the lady's power over Croker was mm -hmm. one magical, not natural, and two that there might be something more to it. And there were all those time lapses too. Well, that, that could be he getting mind raped in some form, but yes, that, that could be a factor. And I, I guess I kind of wanted to explore this because there may be different levels of being taken and do the taken know they're taken? How can you like not, I, the point is you hear Croker has all this constantly having these loathings towards the lady he's constantly saying that we need to get away from her but he's constantly also every time he goes back and he's thinking about it and then he sees her pretty face and he just melts and let's let's talk about the uh let's talk about the dive off of the tower when they went in search and when they were pursuing soul catcher she didn't say a word to him she said oh you will use that bow today and then she was gone and he followed without question without being told to it was like the bow was driving him onward, right? Mm -hmm. But was it the bow or is he taken? Was he cursed? So what's the other thing? What, what's the, what are the other pieces of evidence that suggest that he might be well, taken? Do you guys remember when the, the lady admitted that the taken sometimes have glimpses of the future? And guess what's happening now? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's having glimpses of the future. As a counterpoint, he does say that he – do you remember when they did the when he was doing the reading from the annals? He described himself as a mad prophet. 
that he had read those and like he was gesticulating and he was in all of the histrionics that were involved. He described himself as a mad prophet. So do you have to be taken in order to have visions or are there prophets in the world that can do it without being taken? Nevertheless, it was, it was like within a couple of paragraphs of each other where he has a vision and then the lady tells him that sometimes the taken have visions. Well, and this, this is a little abstract here and a little vile. I, I, don't, I think we avoided mentioning it in, the, in chapter six because it was not pleasant. Um, when he had that dream about violating those two young girls, do you remember that? And yeah. he woke up being disgusted. That also could have been the dominator mm. in his own capacity trying to influence Croker. What's up, Yule? Yeah, uh, I think they were <clears throat> twelve. Uh, that he 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 mentions that he knows it's not good to have thought that the sisters were fourteen years old. Oh, maybe they were fourteen then in the book. No, 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 no. I'm not disputing what you said. Okay. I'm I'm wondering right now if that wasn't the dominator huh. with the lady and her sister. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, well, we'll reread this and figure it out later. <laughs> oh, well, go on, you What's up? What's up? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, kind of. I didn't think that this might have been like uh, taken or uh, underlined this passage. And we were talking about him talking about gods and stuff like that. But maybe there is a force for greater good created by your unconscious minds conjoined or our unconscious minds conjoined, that becomes the independent power greater than the sum of its parts. Maybe being a mind thing is not time bound. Maybe it can see everywhere and everyone and move pawns so that it seems to be today's victory becomes the cornerstone of tomorrow's defeat. And he had the vision like right after that. I, oh yes, thank you for bringing it up, Yule. I remember that too. And I was thinking the same thing this is either literary, literary foreshadowing or he's just musing. But he said, yes, today's victory may be tomorrow's, the cornerstone of tomorrow's defeat. I forgot to mention that. Yes, thank you for bringing that well, up. Well, um, there's another thing. <laughs> so I think it's foreshadowing the next chapter, and I said that before. Uh, and I think it's with Croker and Raven. Croker and Raven have that conversation, and one of the things they say is that um, he, he's going to stay with the company. He says, you fight things your way, I'm going to do it with the family. He's talking about, in this, this passage, he's kind of talking about like two opposing forces doing the same thing, or, or a conjoined mind from different time, and it's just, it's interesting. Well, they're not really an opposed force in that sense, then, are they? I guess that's true. Well, well except for the fact that one's going about something totally different than the other person. They're still doing the same thing. Well, do you, do you remember when, okay, when... Croker was trying to secure supplies from pickles. And that's when he realized that one, well, silent had said, we need two horses. And he's like, no, make that four horses. And then Croker went to pickles. And that's when he was musing as he was negotiating that, wow, what are the odds of me bringing four horses? It's almost as if there was a predetermined, like I'm on a path. There's a, there's fate going on right here. And that's when he was, he was kind of realizing that. But going back to the core topic of whether or not he's taken, I think all the signs are there. She uses her sexuality to bring him back, to control him, to influence him. Okay, so do you remember when Whisper was taken? Do you remember the procedure and how uh, it was horrible? First of all, horrible. she was repeatedly raped by those devils that were fighting over the opportunity. She was killed and resurrected and killed and resurrected. And at the end, she was like a willing slave to the lady, right? Well, maybe, I mean, Croker didn't, Croker was not killed and resurrected and killed and resurrected, but he was also a willing participant, whereas Whisper was opposed. She was completely opposed to the lady. Well, it was also very sudden, whereas I think you were mentioning like Croker was kind of like slowly walked into the, the boiling water, so to speak. Yeah, like a frog like a frog in water that, yeah. that he turns on and doesn't notice that it's dying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, the lady definitely utilized her sexual power over Croker. That's undeniable. Whether or not he's technically taken, 
Mm. Well, there's hard a, to say. Yeah, there's a million examples of well, million, there's many examples of of her like slightly touching him. Yep. Her hot breath on the back of his neck. Yep. Um, the exact image that he had fantasized about, she recreated. Yep. So or, when they're talking about um, what. Raven should not go to where he's going. Raven's going to be like, oh, he says something like, oh, well, I think I'll go. And then Croker's like, don't tell me. Yeah, I've been through. The, I've been in I've front been of the eye twice already. Twice. It's going to happen. He knows again. that he's compromised. Yep. I, I feel like he's, um, he feels like he's even a secret mole to some degree. Okay. But that is not evidence that he isn't taken uh -huh. because the limper was taken and so was Soulcatcher, and both of them opposed the lady. Yes. Well, let's explain that. I've thought about this. And so do you remember when the lady was taking Whisper? Whisper got afraid because she understood, and the lady laughed and said, you think the Dominator was the only one who could perform this right? Which makes me think that none of the other Taken were her Taken. They might not have been. I've thought about that as well. All of those Taken were taken by the Dominator. Well, some have to have been. That's that's how she can. That's how they get around. That's how they get around being absolutely loyal to her. Yes, that's okay. Yeah, no, I I, I can completely see that. You're right. Does that make sense? It does. It does. It doesn't make sense that she wouldn't have done it herself, though. Like, why would she? Why wouldn't she have just done it herself? Why wait and reveal that information when she takes Whisper? Were they loyal to her? Why would they be loyal to her if she didn't do the taking? Well, hopefully it gets uh, talked about in future books. There you go again. <laughs> there you go again. Okay, plot hook. I don't. I don't know. I, I, I don't either. I don't remember. Hole, not plot hook. Plot I hole. don't. I don't remember. But it's a so, very. It's a very good point. So, it's fact. What did? What is the lady's refrain? Do you guys remember? Uh, uh, believe in me, and you'll be taken care of. Oh, my faithful have nothing to fear. Oh, that's what it is. Thank you. Uh huh. Did you guys ever play Bioshock? No. Okay. I don't remember what it's called, but it's like a mnemonic trigger, right? Where the main character is asked to do something. He says, if you will please. And that's the trigger that gets him. It's like a command, essentially. The lady says this thing over and over and over. So I was wondering if that wasn't further evidence that she was actually taking Croker in the process. Yeah, like... Some, in dream. Yeah, mnemonic. No, it's mnemonic brainwashing. And yes, in his dreams, it, it comes. But we've already realized that those dreams are not dreams. They come from her, directly into his mind. Right. So let's talk about one other thing that's been bugging me about how magic happens in this world. Go on. Well, for instance, you have like the hanged man and the limper and all these people that are like grotesque and mauled and dead but alive. And I don't know what they are. And then you have the lady that's just like this pristine pristine, and so was soul catcher right she hides it but soul catcher was like beautiful twin of the lady and death did not change that for soul catcher she was still beautiful so does magic in some way preserve a body does having power preserve a body because remember one eye they said wow one eye is like very very old he joined the company a hundred years ago or so and is over a hundred years old himself I think that there may be a correlation between how much power you possess and how well your body is preserved because these people were killed at some point in time. Okay. So I was thinking, I was wondering about the same thing earlier because the terminology that is used mm -hmm. was during whispers taking, mm -hmm. she was killed and resurrected, killed and resurrected. And then when she warns soul catcher, when the lady warns soul catcher, well, she's really warning Stormbringer, but she's using Soulcatcher as a, as a go-between. She says, tell anybody that's thinking about resurrecting my husband that I can do this. Is, you know, anyway. So the point is, they are actually dying. Like, people are dying and being resurrected. So the Dominator's dead. From all, for all intents and purposes, he's dead and he's in a grave, but his spirit is still around. His soul is still vital. And he's trying to get out, but he needs to be helped out. Does that mean he needs to be resurrected? I mean, really, it's a question. I don't understand it well, either. I think they actually said they need some, somebody has to help him out. He cannot get out by himself. But does that mean resurrection or does that mean, hey, open the door? I, I don't know. But if you compare like these grotesque people to like 
Um, yeah, the limper was just not nearly as powerful as Soul Catcher. That's how I interpret it. That is also exactly. But also, here's something we've all put all the pieces together, and the lady and Soul Catcher were they dominated early, like as in children? Because you remember, Soul Catcher said that, oh, the lady murdered her sister when she was 14. Yeah. Well, did she literally murder her, or is it kind of like the death of self? Well, Croker she's, wonders. She's talking about herself, right? I don't know. Croker wonders the same thing at one point. She's, she's like, talking about herself. She's just being coy about it. Maybe, maybe he he does speculate that there could have been three sisters. It well, could have been triplets. You suggested this last yeah, time. I did, I did, but I I just kind of thinking it might be that. My, my point is, we we just had this epiphany that maybe the dominator doing vile things to those two little girls who may have been the lady and soul catcher, right? Thus being alive, maybe even willing. Maybe they were taken, like I said, in a different way than killed and resurrected, killed and resurrected. Just like Croker is now taken, but not forcibly taken. He's, he was willingly taken. If he was taken. He was pretty much a willing oh, I participant. I think he is. On some level, I think. I don't know. Um, I don't remember the following books. I don't remember book two and book three, Shadows Linger and the White Rose. I don't remember. And I don't know that there is anything that really indicates what it means to be taken. Like, I don't know what the rules are for being taken, like what it forces you to do, what it forces you not to do. I don't remember. But it's an interesting notion, and it's certainly a possibility. All right, so I have a question for both of you. At what point do you guys think Raven – became aware that Darling was the White Rose. Maybe he... Hmm. I think I remember the scene where Croker goes to talk to Darling and he was, she was showing off her doll. And that's when Raven came in and just got between them. Yeah, that's when I realized that something was up. Yeah, and that's when he's like, Jesus, you know? Yeah. Whatever, but I think that was the, that was the first indication that I remember, and that was a long since time ago. The thing is, since it's from Croker's point of view, we're not going to know when Raven really realized something. That's when they were marching towards the stairs of Tear, or at the stair of Tear. That's when Croker went to go see her, and she had the doll that Raven had lovingly made, and he was like, "When did Raven have the time?" Mm. And that's when Raven got in between them. You know? Do you remember that? Yeah. I do. Yeah. The first memory I can think of. It was like two friends that are kind of going their own way. I'm hanging out with Soul Catcher and the lady, and you're hanging out with Captain and Darling. And uh, <laughs> they kind of looked at each I mean, Raven is very suspicious of him just because of who he's, you know, who he's hanging out with. Yeah, I would be too. So, especially okay. if he thinks that this girl's special. Right. <laughs> now, do, you guys, do you guys remember, I've already brought it up once, but do you remember when they set that trap for Raker? Yeah. And do you remember how concerned Raven was with the money? Yeah. Yeah. He was disproportionately concerned about the money. Like he did not care if anything happened to anybody. He wanted that money. And like I went back and I listened to all of our previous podcasts in order to kind of brush up for this discussion. And I'm wondering now if that if he knew way back then. I think that there's a possibility that he knew that he was going to have to bankroll Darling's life and education and et cetera. And then that may have been because he didn't. He was just like, he's going to take the money away if we don't get out of here. Let's go. I remember that. And I, I, I think there, you, you might have a thought that's it's completely hypothetical that he wanted that money, if nothing else, than to give to Darling to, to kick her out, to make her go away. Now the hole in my little theory here is that when Raven left with Darling, he did not take his money. He left it with Elmo. Yeah, you have a big hole there. It's a big hole. It is a big hole. So, well, when you're getting out, you're getting out. That's true, but he, he took supplies. He got, he got his supplies two days ahead of time. Food. Yeah, and he didn't get any money. But that may have been a, that may have been a tell, you know? Too that, suspicious. Yeah, give me all my money. Cause I'm, I'm leaving. But anyway, that was the, that was the first thing I noticed about Raven's behavior that suggests, cause I remember thinking about it at the time that it was really odd that he would care about the money more than his own life, but he definitely did. Well, that definitely made sense. But I mean, I, it's odd that him, that Raven knowing his character would care about the money. Yeah. Yet he plays Tonk all the time and that's for money. Right, right, right. But this is a lot of money. It was an obscene amount. Yeah. So maybe even then he was not completely convinced that he wanted to be with the company. 
right? Because um, he was so new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get you. I get you. All right. So let's see. Okay. During the during chapter four, oh, there's two things I want to discuss. One of them is kind of a very high level analysis of what the black company is in the world. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is, we were just talking about it. Go on. When Raven and Croker and Elmo took all that money and at the end, cause they didn't say anything about it to anybody. And remember soul catcher said to Croker, you and Raven have a toast to me. Mm -hmm. Do you think she saw something in the future? Like her own death, them surviving. I, and, you know, that just makes me want to know what was she trying to communicate to Croker after her head got taken off? Oh, yeah. Uh, that too. Because he said, he said that he's gone over it 10,000 times, which tells me one thing very importantly is that he has a lot of remorse about that act. But I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know that we'll ever know. But that's one of the reasons why I like this book so much. There are questions that are asked that don't take me out of the story, that keep me wondering, that, that provide kind of a richer tapestry, a deeper, a deeper story than you would normal, not normally get, but that you might get otherwise. Like not knowing all the answers is better than knowing the answers. In some cases, yes, unless the person asking the questions doesn't know the yeah. answers. Who's that guy that did Survivor that never told you the answers? Survivor? No, Lost. Oh, J.J. Abrams. Yeah. yeah. Well, he told us the answers. Well, he might have, but you know, he, whatever. Let's not talk about JJ right now. Boo, uh, that's a totally different podcast. It is. Okay, so hold on. There were two things. One of them was I lost one of them. You said chapter four. I interrupted you. My apologies. It's okay. Why don't you okay. think about it? I'm so now, this, this is this is the other. This is one of the two questions that I want to ask, and I think it's the more important of the two. So the one that I've lost, I've lost. Croker describes the black company as uh, when he's doing the reading, he's, he says that the black company was really black back then. And that was when they were working for the pain God of Chon Delore. Right. And this was like three centuries ago and they were really the black company back then, which suggests to me, that there is a transition. There is a passage through time of the black company. And as they're going through time, they're becoming lighter. They're becoming whiter to the point where they nurtured the white rose. The black company did that. The black company, Raven really did that, but the black company took in Raven and then Raven. Okay. So then the black company, the black company stopped her abuse saved her life, saved her grandfather's life, raised her essentially in the army for years, but they nurtured her. They, they brought the white rose about. Okay. So, so they, to be, they lovingly nurtured her like, like a little sister or something to that effect. Like they, they mentioned it multiple times, all these hardened mercenaries yes. talking about how they missed her because she was so awesome. Right. Do uh, you remember that, that paragraph that both of you pointed out about kind of like group think at the very end? Yeah. Is it possible that the organization of the black company makes men better than they would be on their own? And is that tendency creating goodness in the world? It is a very dark and vile world. And on some level, the black company had something to do with the white roses growth, right? They helped her come into being. Is it the black company? Is it just the organization? They, they described Silent at one point as being among their blackest, right? And yet Silent is super good friends with Darling, the White Rose. And he's the one that wanted to go after, go after them. Yeah. So on some level, I don't know the answer to this question. I pose it hypothetically just so that you guys can think about it. You know how they say religion makes people better, right? Is it just that the black company is an organization and over time they've like, the, think, of, think about the men who run the black company, the captain, Croker, Elmo, Silent, the wizards. None of them participate in the spoils of war. None of them were out there raping. No, they're, are you sure? Yes. Whitey was, but Whitey's uh, Whitey, just a guy. Right. 
Whitey's right. just one of the members, right? And the people that really took joy in that were the new, the newcomers, the people that weren't even in the black company. There was hangers on. I, I hear what you're saying, and I think there may be some truth there. You know how, like, you have better behavior when your mother is watching, <laughs> right? Yeah, and these, these are good, decent men that run the black company now. Well, my, my point there is, like, in Darling's presence, that, 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 that perfect image of innocence, they want to act better. So her presence itself, to, to be a little metaphysical here, she possesses such overwhelming goodness, righteousness, I don't know what you call it, purity, innocence, that it radiates outward. And you can't help but be infected by it. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does, but I will also point out that the black company existed before her, right? And they and did she ain't say- around her, anymore. Right? They did save her. What, Yule? And I said, and she ain't around anymore. She's not. And I don't remember. I don't, I don't want to know. I want to reread the books. I just want to reread the books. I told you. Yes, we've all reread this book, but the truth is I only remember like two things about the future, like the future books, two future books, and I'm not going to tell them to you, but I only remember two things. So, so <laughs> either I have a really horrible memory. True. Or I just was not paying attention. Or um, I need a to read lot of years and talk have about it with you guys. Time has passed. I yeah, think I'm watching should... a lot of Netflix. What now? Netflix? I said time has passed. I watched a lot of Netflix. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Can't remember it all. Well, the moral of the story is you don't know a book until you've read it, you've read it three times and discussed it with your friends. <laughs> right. Good plan, right? Good plan. All right, I'm going to just peruse some notes real quick. If you guys think of anything, bring it up. All right. You asked what our main point of the book is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. You said a one-sentence main point for what you, I thought this book was all about. Yeah. All right. Although there is some good in the black company, although there is some bad in the black company, they are family. And there's only two ways to leave. Mm, yep. Except Raven, who was taken into the family, <laughs> left in a third way. So <laughs> Raven figured a third way, actually. <laughs> Do you guys remember chapter one? No. I remember a lot of it. Do you remember? Do you remember when the four Velaka was at work and pestilence was coming about? Yes. And we didn't know. And we were like, what? They, they it, went into the was it those things being dropped like it was? That's the question. I so, see. That's well, interesting. I, I, I thought that was the four Velanka bringing it for some reason. And yet they discounted that completely because they oh, went to the right. of the four Velaka and none of them got sick. That's right. And so all of a sudden there's these attacks by the four Velaka and people are dropping dead from pestilence as well. And they're like, that doesn't make any sense. But you know what does make sense is the howler dropping those physical objects that he could have given to another one of the Taken. We've already speculated that Shapeshifter was there and was the one that actually killed Tom Tom. It's more than reasonable that the four Velaka was actually up there but was captured, put on the boat, and then Shapeshifter comes into town and does all of the real dirty work because they can control Shapeshifter. Shapeshifter knows exactly what to do. Just because we didn't hear about Shapeshifter or the Howler being in town doesn't mean that they weren't. Well, let's go back to the tomb. The tomb was, the wards were struck by lightning. Yeah, out of the blue, clear and, blue sky. And then they speculated that looters went into the tomb, which has been ignored for millennia, right? right. Hundreds and hundreds of years. And there were stone, there were tool works, tool marks on the on the walls well, and stuff. So they definitely did get in well, the last half of well, the Well, that's, that's what we were told. They don't know. But why is it unreasonable that, that, uh, that one, well, we, Soul Catcher destroyed the wards and her men were right there to capture the four of Laka. And she was. She didn't let it out. She went there to capture it. And to take it north. And to take it north. Yeah. Um, and I think the four of Laka that was in the terrorizing the town was complete. Uh, of a shapeshifter. Uh, shapeshifter MO. He, he soused terror by giving random attacks. And nobody ever saw this thing, right? You just heard. Things. Well, we, we did see it come in over the wall. Yes, I know. We, we did. Or sorry, Croker did. Yeah. 
But in general, they didn't hear reports of it. This is all they found was shredded bodies. Which and was, that is completely uh, shapeshifters MO. Well, in the, in the last chapter, in chapter six, Croker discounts the four Velaka's presence on the battlefield saying, now that's shapeshifters MO dressing up like a cat and attacking people and tearing them apart. That's shapeshifter. He discounted the four Velaka, even though it was there and it was proven to be there later on. Um, I will also point out that they had described hearing these disturbing howling sounds in chapter one. And then you read chapter six and you're like, that could have been the howler. It could have very easily been the howler in town. There's no, I mean, there's no reason to assume that it was the four Velaka at this point when we've seen that shapeshifter can take his shape and we're very, very strongly suspicious that it was just shapeshifter. Plus the plague howler and the plague. Yeah. You will. Yeah. I don't oh, have anything. Sorry. To add. Did we disturb you? No, I don't have anything to add. You have nothing to add. All right. So who killed Tom Tom then? I thought it was a four Velaka originally, but it seems like it was what shapeshifter, right? How do you feel about one eye torturing the four Velaka at the end then? I don't know. They, they seem pretty brainless, right? I the mean, four Velaka? Not, no, they're not brainless. I don't mean it that way. I just, you know, they're, they're like animals, you know? I don't think so, buddy. Oh, no. What does it well, matter? Would you torture an animal? One of them? <laughs> it's crucified, man. It's on yeah. a cross. Crucified. Well, it's and he's still alive. Crucified. I mean, it. It's not going to die on that cross. How do you know that? Well, the, the, the process of crucifying a human being can take up to 24 hours. You slowly lose the strength to support yourself on your wounds such that you can't breathe anymore. I got gotcha. you. You lose that strength, but it can take up to 24 hours depending on the vitality of the person. And here we have a, an animal or a creature that is extremely vital Dude, they oh. took that one down in the in the tower, right? And they were like stabbing the hell out of it. And it was like 10 guys on top of it. And they're like, all right, we got it down. And then it broke out. <laughs> yeah, but that might have been shaped. Oh, uh, that's true. And you remember how vital Limper was after being shot with his with his own true name on the on the arrow shaft. Yeah. All right. Well, we're circling the drain right now, essentially. Would you guys agree? I agree. Philip, do you have anything that you would like to add at this point? Let's at least have a little thing about are we going to do what are we doing next as a group? My understanding is we are not doing the second chapter of the Black Company, which means if you're waiting for this on pins and needles, it might be a while. Um, we did a good hook for people to want to read the next book. Yeah, I agree. I think that we've done our job. We introduced iBeans to it. We got Jeff Hunt reading it. We got other people reading this book. Mm -hmm. And anybody that comes across these that is inclined to like this kind of material will probably read book two and three on their own without our assistance. Right. And then we can always get back to it also. We I can. Mean, we well, they, they, they will read it without our assistance, but then they will rely on us to interpret it for them. <laughs> if, <laughs> if they need such help. Um, okay. But that, that is a good point. Let's talk about the future really quick. Cause I think that we've, we've plumbed the depths of this novel and we've come to the end the first book of the trilogy, but we are going to, we're going to read something else next because this took six months and we, whatever the point is what's next. You will, what's the next book? We are going to be reading Steven Erickson's gardens of the moon. 1999. If I'm not mistaken, excellent book, extraordinarily deep. We, we alluded to it in the first episode that we were, we were heading that direction. We kind of think we know what we're doing now, sort of. So we're going to, we're going to do it. Gardens of the Moon. Awesome. Can't wait. But let's put in a little plug for something else you're doing right now. Sabriel's almost done. We've got one more episode for that one as well. It's also found in the same exact place. It's under the science fiction fantasy read along podcast. I don't, I don't actually take part in that. So if I'm your favorite out of this trio, just don't bother, don't bother reading because I'm not there. Yeah, that's a good point. If you, if you like Phil more than you like me or Yule. Well, I'm not on that one either. So if you don't like Lule then you might want to not watch that one. You guys are nuts. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me bring up the script so that we can finish this off. No, it has my girlfriend working with you on that one. Gilles, Gilles B. Pill. Gilles B. Pill. All right. So thank you all for joining us for another episode of Science Fiction and Fantasy Read Along. If you enjoyed this book just like we did, please let us know. 
If you'd like to see a particular book, let us know about that as well. We'll certainly entertain the notion. Use the links available to follow or subscribe. And please, by all means, keep reading everyone.